Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Wood, editor and publisher of Biz West, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Small Business Interrupted, the second installment of Life Interrupted, a webinar series presented by Biz West and Delta Dental of Colorado. Today's installment will explore the short and long-term effects of COVID-19 on mental health for the region's small business community. Employers of all sizes have seen drastic changes to their workplace, and predictions say a large number of workers will experience mental health challenges due to social distancing and stress. In particular, small businesses are struggling or closing altogether through no fault of their own. Business owners and their families are under incredible stress. What are the long-term mental health effects of this devastating event for small business owners, managers, and employees? Our program today will seek to answer that question as we explore in detail what small business owners can do to support mental health amidst COVID-19, a severe economic recession, and calls for social justice. I would like to thank our sponsors for today's, today's program, our title sponsor, Delta Dental of Colorado, and our supporting sponsor, Foundations Counseling, LLC. Before we begin our program, I would like to turn to Mark Thompson, Vice President of Sales for Delta Dental of Colorado, to say a few words. Mark, good morning. Uh, good morning, Chris, and good morning to everyone. And thank you for joining us today for this timely and important discussion. The novel coronavirus has interrupted every facet of our lives. Today, we will discuss how the crisis and other unrest in our nation has impacted small business owners and their employees. The panelists will tackle the issues surrounding the long-term mental health effects of these unprecedented times. I'm Mark Thompson, Vice President of Sales and Group Experience for Delta Dental of Colorado. We are the state's largest dental benefits provider and a strong supporter of small businesses. Delta Dental is a not-for-profit organization with a mission to improve the oral health of the communities we serve. We are proud to sponsor today's event. Small business is big business to us, and we know that keeping you and your employees happy, healthy, and productive is important. And based on our current economic environment, I believe Colorado needs small businesses more than ever. We must do all that we can to ensure that you can be successful and that your employees are thriving. The reality is that many of us are reacting differently to the pressures of COVID-19. We have a panel of experts today who will provide high insights and resources on how to ensure we are addressing mental health well-being during the pandemic. I'm eager to hear more from our panel and look forward to our time together and I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to Delta Dental for its support of the Life Interrupted webinar series. Our panel today brings a wide range of experience and expertise to the topic of mental health, law, human resources, and small business consulting. Chris Berger is the founder and CEO of Foundations Counseling, LLC, which he launched in 2007. With 23 counselors spread throughout five locations in Fort Collins, Loveland, and Windsor, the company provides mental health therapy and has developed and cultivated a variety of strategic alliances with businesses, medical offices, law firms, schools, and places of worship to provide support to individuals, couples, and families throughout Northern Colorado. Magara Kastner is a consultant, coach, trainer, and mediator with Employers Council. She has more than 25 years experience in leadership-related fields and specializes in working with groups toward developing open communication and strategies to succeed in their businesses. And Mike O'Connell is Senior Director of the Larimer Small Business Development Center. He became Director of the Larimer SBDC in 2013, leading the organization to become one of the state's top performing centers by 2016. Prior to joining the SBDC, he owned and operated Mountain Woods Furniture a national designer and manufacturer of rustic handcrafted furniture, which he sold in 2012. And I'd like to welcome all of our panelists to this discussion. Uh, before we begin our conversation, I want to uh, tell the audience that you can use the Q&A tool in Zoom to send questions to the, to the panelists. 
and we will try to work those in uh, during the presentations or during the uh, Q&A period at the end. Uh, I also have a question that I would like to direct to our attendees. You are able to use the chat feature to answer this question, and this really resulted from a question submitted by an attendee prior to the event. What is the most surprising or perhaps positive thing that you've seen come out of the COVID-19 experience? So if you're an attendee and you can think of something surprising or positive that has happened uh, to you or your company or your family, uh, please submit that in the chat area of Zoom. And we will, uh, if we get enough of those uh, great ideas or great uh, positive things that have occurred or surprising things, we will provide those to everyone at the, uh, after the uh, presentation. All right, let's, uh, let's begin. We're going to begin with a, a big question here. I'm going to direct it uh, first to Chris, and then we'll get uh, Magara and Mike's input as well. But I'm, I'm just wondering, Chris, what are the biggest mental health challenges posed to small business owners or employees by the coronavirus, the economic recession, and the social justice issues that we see have emerged here, especially in the last uh, month and a uh, couple of months? Great question, Chris. Um, the abundance of mental health challenges across the board uh, is something I believe we're all aware of. Um, certain specifics I'm going to get into, um, but one of the more fascinating studies that has come out um, is from the University of Chicago that uh, in interviewing and taking anecdotal research and putting together quantitative analysis, Americans are currently the unhappiest they have been in a 50 year period. As a matter of fact, only 14% rate themselves as genuinely happy. Um, depression, anxiety are through the roof. The social isolation and social distancing have taken their toll. It's now beginning to show up in abundance in post-traumatic stress disorder. Addictions are also growing through the roof. Um, and domestic violence and child abuse have also increased. One of the most important elements for all business owners and small businesses in general is not to become reactive, but rather responsive. To not overreact, but at the same time to make sure they're not underreacting. We all, to some degree, myself included, our team here at Foundations Counseling, all have to be very aware of the basic human need for safety and security. And what comes to mind is um, a quote, I believe it was from Simon Sinek, I'm not sure where it originated, but a leader's role is not so much just to be in charge, but to be taking care of the people that are in their charge. In other words, providing that safety and security and emotional well-being, um, while at the same time, keeping an eye on the larger picture in the role of, uh, of leading an organization and continuing to produce the products and services our society need, balancing it all is really where one of the greatest challenges is. Great, thank you, Chris. And Magara, I'll turn to you with the, the same question on uh, what are some of the biggest uh, mental health challenges that you see presented to small business owners or employees? Well, I, I think I wanna, I wanna play a little bit on what Chris was just saying is, there's been a break in our social contract here. <clears throat> There's a social contract here that work is going to take care of us. It's going to provide us with, with income. It's going to provide us with some security. It's going to provide us with insurance and all of those pieces. And right now that social contract has been broken uh, because there's so much tentativeness, I guess is the best word to use, in what's happening. I mean, daily <laughs> we get another report that says now this is what the virus is doing, or now this is what things are looking like with, or now this is what's coming out of Washington, and, and um, this is what's coming out of our state as to how we should be operating our businesses. So part of that is it feels like there's been a break in that social contract. With that then comes that sense, Chris talked about anxiety, what comes now is that sense of vulnerability. Our brains, from a neuroscience perspective, are not really set up to be vulnerable. Our brains are set up that we are the center of the universe <laughs> and everything is under control. I see Chris smiling right now from, from my screen. 
So that sense of, of vulnerability, the frustration that can come up, um, makes it very difficult for our brains to sort it out. And later on, I can talk a little bit too, and, and I'm sure Chris knows this as well, you know, the whole um, brain hormones that start to show up and high levels of cortisol and what that creates. So we have, there's basically three terms I want to introduce and then pass it on to Mike, is there's that survivor's guilt. In other words, I get to keep coming back to work, you know, where others may have been laid off or furloughed for a while. How do I manage that? Um, there's that envy, like, hmm, actually, you know, they don't have to be here in the middle of this every day. I kind of like it on the other side of how things are going. And there's also that survivor's contagion in that, that sadness and that frustration of seeing people have to leave or how to bring people back. It's really playing a lot with our mental health and how do we balance all those pieces. Absolutely. And Mike, you, you, uh, uh, you deal with small businesses all the time. So what are you uh, hearing from them? What are you uh, seeing as, as some of those uh, greatest uh, mental health challenges? Uh, yes, and I, I very much like what uh, uh, Chris and Magara have said so far. Uh, uh, and I'm going to kind of jump back and forth between my own experience with owning a business as well as running the SBDC. And we consulted last year with about 900 clients, both uh, existing businesses as well as people who are looking to start a business. And uh, one of the things that shocked me the most when I moved from the corporate world to owning my own business was the loneliness. Uh, you didn't have peers anymore to hang around the kitchenette or the water cooler with, to bounce something off of in a non-threatening way. You might have had very sensitive subjects that maybe you didn't feel comfortable at that point in time talking to employees about, but the loneliness was very surprising to me. I didn't expect that. And that was pre-COVID. Uh, so now with social distancing, uh, loss of uh, personal contact, uh, that's a pretty big issue. And when you combine that to me with, uh, uh, to answer Chris, your question more directly about what are we seeing from clients is the, the wide range of uncertainty about when or can I be open? Are my revenues going to be down 10% or are they going to be down 50%? Uh, you know, let's say you lose a customer and it's going to be 15% of your sales. I mean, you can right size the business. It's not going to be pleasant, but you can get there. Uh, but when you don't have any idea what the revenue is going to be, that becomes much harder, much tougher to manage, much more uh, challenging to maintain leadership throughout. So those are the challenges that I see and uh, we'll elaborate more um, during the course of this call. Thank you, Mike. And Chris, speaking to what Magara said, there, the, the back and forth of recommendations that people hear from the, the federal government, from the WHO, from state government, from local officials, uh, has got to create some additional stress for, for individuals, small business owners or, or employees or, or just general citizens. Uh, you know, do they, is it safe to go to a bar or not to, right now? No, but uh, uh, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you speak to that a little bit, just the back and forth of that and what that uh, how that affects uh, individuals? Good question. It's funny. I was just thinking about this early this morning. Um, my mother was British, and she, as a young child, survived through World War II. And the leaders of that time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, they would come out with consistency of messages. And again, it was a very different time. There was not the proliferation of technology and the constant, never-ending news cycle but the leader's role at that time was to create a sense of certainty and clarity and consistency of message as opposed to what we are seeing now is a lack of consistency a constant reactivity back and forth left and right and so rather than giving people an opportunity to settle in to adjust to absorb the information and then to accommodate that information and make the necessary adjustments as individuals, as companies, as families, it's a constant state of heightened arousal. And the human body is not really built for chronic arousal, long-term chronic arousal. We are built to deal very, very well with acute stress in terms of how our body responds we respond very quickly to acute stress and 
physiologically as well as mentally, um, we adapt. Long, ongoing chronic stress takes a dramatic toll, not only mentally, but physiologically on the body, which then makes us more susceptible to the very disease itself that we are attempting to fight. Um, therefore, the business owner must play that role to the best of their ability of providing that consistency and a, a bit more of a grounding or a solid, consistent message and, um, and letting people know at least there is a, a safe place and where people can, whether they go to work physically or um, work from home, um, it's definitely one of the challenges we're facing. Thank you, Chris. And Chris, I'm going to start with you on this next one uh, as well. Uh, you were on our last uh, Life Interrupted edition, uh, Workplace Interrupted. And we had asked, I had asked this question toward the end, and I, I wished I had asked it earlier because it got so much uh, play, so much interest from the audience. But one of the, the greatest stresses for a business owner or a manager is if they have to uh, lay off and furlough or furlough workers. Uh, they have to keep their customers and employees safe. They also have to maintain financial viability of their business. How, how can small business owners and managers handle all of those added stresses that are, are so prevalent right now in, in, in everything they do? They're really fighting to survive and they're in some cases having to make very difficult decisions and uh, lay off or furlough workers. The one key element that comes to mind immediately is transparency. Uh, the need for trust is paramount right now. And the way we continue to build trust, enhance the trust we have is more and more transparency. Uh, we, years and years ago, instituted an open book accounting system. We share the financials that may not necessarily be appropriate for all businesses, but anything that can lead to or enhance the level of transparency. So therefore, if there is even the potential of upcoming furloughs, layoffs, adjustments that an organization makes, the more people can be open with those conversations, again, when appropriate, and include people in those conversations so that there's less of a constant shock to the system, more time to adjust, more ongoing conversations, making sure there is also an open door policy with it, um, an owner or as many of the leaders in an organization uh, would also be very helpful in this adjustment. Thank you, Chris. And Magara, your, your thoughts on that? Again, I want to play on what Chris is saying is that transparency means that you as a human being, as the, the owner of the company, as the manager of the company, as the CEO or the COO, letting people know where you are doing, how you are doing in this process too, to be able to show some of your vulnerability, to be able to say, hey, here's where I'm struggling. I love Chris's idea on the open door policy. And if you're always looking stout and you're always looking completely under control, people get that almost unspoken norm that that's how they should look too. And you lose a little bit of that, that connection. So the opportunity that you're willing to share, you as the leader, as the business owner, share what's going on for you, what feels appropriate um, to allow them, to give them permission to also be able to share what's going on. So make those connections as much as you can. One of the pieces when I was doing um, some research for some classes I created on crisis leadership um, here recently was the Ask Me Anything meeting. In other words, once a week, anybody can come in and can ask you any question they want. Now, you may have the answer, you may not have the answer, but that helps build, that starts to build that trust, that transparency. Yeah, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Let's see if we can figure it out. So I think that that weeness that you can create and show your part of vulnerability and where um, you're struggling a little bit too, I think is very helpful to normalize what's going on. Thank you, Magara. And Mike, you've, uh, you've been an entrepreneur and you work with entrepreneurs. So as you, as, as you see what's happening now in terms of the, the stresses on small business owners and managers, uh, how, 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 
how can they address that? How can they handle those added stresses? Uh, well, I'll just get inside of my own head. Uh, I'm going to go back uh, several years ago, again, when I was in the corporate world, and I was working for a really sharp guy who was a mentor of mine. Uh, we had some unfortunate revenue situations happen. We had to let some people go. Uh, and I'm going through this in my head and my gut's churning. And uh, I still remember what he told me. He said, uh, you know, if we end up trying to take care of everybody, we're going to end up taking care of nobody. And as draconian and as harsh as that sounds, sometimes those are the decisions that, that lead us to. And I'll fast forward now a little more current situation. Uh, I know a woman that runs a restaurant who is one of the best people uh, managers that I've, I've ever seen. Uh, great credibility, great trust with her staff. Uh, when this pandemic came down, she made the decision pretty early that, I'm going to lay off all my staff. And the reason she made this decision is she wanted to make sure that they were first in line to get unemployment benefits. She connected them to the resource, had a meeting with them. They all understood why that was being done. And that turned out to be absolutely correct. And she didn't procrastinate about it as brutal and as gut wrenching a decision as it was. Uh, it was made and, and she moved forward. Uh, Chris used the word transparency. I will bring in the, the word trust into this as well, too. Uh, if you don't have trust with your team and your people, it's pretty hard to build it when the crisis hits. That's kind of something that you have to be working on throughout and have that relationship. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, I wanna remind the audience, you can submit questions using the Q&A tool. I see we've gotten a lot of uh, surprising things or positive things that, that have emerged for companies. So that is, that is good, that's been submitted in the chat, but you can use the Q&A tool to submit any question uh, to the panelists and we will attempt to get to those. I'm gonna to turn to, to a question that was submitted by an attendee in advance uh, through the registration process. And I'm going to just throw this open to any, any of the panelists who, who want to respond. But the question was pertaining to uh, how to handle the added stresses of having family members working with you. So you, you, could, be, uh, uh, you could be in an office or in a, in, so, in a business location, or you could be at home. And that can create uh, uh, stresses on its own as well. Even in normal times, working closely with a family member can be stressful. And in times like these, I would think that those stresses could be, could be magnified. So I'm, I, I would just toss that open to the, uh, uh, to the panelists uh, to respond, whoever would like to chime in first. Uh, I'll go ahead and take that one, Chris, if I could. Uh, when I ran my uh, business, uh, I co-owned that with my, uh, my now ex-wife. And that was pretty challenging because it, the work, the business tended to overwhelm the relationship. Uh, I personally, it didn't work out well for me. I, I think looking back on it, I needed to have a lot better definition of what she was responsible and accountable for and what I was responsible and accountable for because it, it versus me being over everything, it kind of ended up being a subordinate senior relationship and that certainly did not work well in a marriage. Uh, and she did a great job with her part of the business and we actually ran the business for a year while we got divorced, which was, uh, uh, that was challenging. So. Absolutely, Chris, thoughts on that? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll sort of build off what Mike said. I think uh, a couple key words, key phrases that come to mind are that role distinction. And one of the things a lot of families, whether it's just uh, partners or spouses or whether there's uh, potentially grown children or several generations involved, is really, really defining the roles, what people are responsible for, but also what people are not responsible for. Um, from a therapy standpoint, counseling standpoint, the word that always comes to mind is boundaries, figuring out where the relationship between business associates starts and finishes and where the relationship on a family level starts and finishes. One recommendation for this is one of the challenges a lot of families face, whether it's two people or you know a dozen people involved that are related in some way or another, is families tend to overlook traditional corporate structure meetings, whether it's a small business, medium or large, the ne necessity for having regular meetings, um, and I would say at a minimum once a week, to really address those issues of what are people's roles, 
and responsibilities. And that gives a little bit of a clarity and marching orders as to who is doing what and who is not doing what. And a lot of family run businesses have a tendency to just roll up their sleeves and go to work Monday morning at eight or 9 a.m. and not really have formalized meetings. They have a lot of check-ins, but uh, that is one way to bridge the gap. Thank you, Chris. McGarrick, uh, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, just a quick thought. One thing that I think will be important to add here too is a conversation that you have. So here's what I look like when I'm stressed, okay? When I'm stressed at work, when I'm in the grip, if you will, this is how I manage myself. This is what I need when I'm at work, right? At home, you probably already have those stories going. And I think this is what Chris is talking about. There can be a blend of those stories. Our imaginations plays such a huge role that the, the stories from home can end up becoming the stories at work too, or vice versa. So making sure that you understand, here's what stress looks like and here's how I manage it when I'm at work. Here's how stress looks like, here's how I manage it, and here's the support I need at home. And really creating those distinctions because when we're in stress, we are the least resourced. Our brains go straight to what our patterns are that are most practiced. So if there's an opportunity to actually make those distinctions at that stress level can help balance out those boundaries that Chris talked about. I'd also, I'd also add in, it occurs to me, one of the very important elements not to lose sight of is families must also not let their relationships become exclusively work. You've got to get out of the work mode and partners must continue to date and have romance and courtship. Family members must continue to have fun and engage and play together and make sure there's a balance there outside of the work environment where they're still a family. Great. Thank you all for that. Uh, one of our attendees, Don, says that he and his wife have been working together for 24 years and it can work. So congratulations to Don and his wife for making it work. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, turn our attention to um, how an employer or an owner can support their employees and their employees' families uh, when they themselves are feeling stressed out. What are some, some things that an, an employer or a manager can do to help their employees and, and, their, and their own families uh, uh, during this time of stress? So, Chris, I might uh, start with you uh, again one more time. Sure. Well, the very first piece of the puzzle is we need to model for others what both what we consider is healthy self-care and to help people engage in their own self-care. So the very first thing a leader or an owner of any organization can do is simply make the right choices on a regular day-to-day -day basis. And specifically from a physiological standpoint, uh, I always, always ask people, now their eating habits, their exercise habits, their sleep habits, as well as how healthy their sexual, uh, their sex life is. In, in terms of we must not overlook our physiological component, but also on the mental side, what are people doing to disengage? A phenomenal book I recommend is called The Power of Full Engagement. And it talks about the concept in order to be fully engaged, we must at times be fully disengaged. And finding those ways that are very unique to every individual to disconnect, disengage, whether it's music or movies or crosswords or Sudokus or going for a walk or whatever it is we need to do to recharge our batteries and engage in self-care to therefore bring to the table our best selves, whatever that looks like on any given day, um, finding that balance is unique to each of us. Thank you, Chris. Magara. I think the other piece that can show up here too is where where is flexibility allowed or not allowed? <laughs> you know, in other words, um, are you focusing just on results or is time important too? So a discussion as a group, the more that you can include everyone, so you as the leader, you as the owner of the company aren't having to hold everything right here. Is there a way to distribute that out and have those collective discussions? So what does flexibility mean? Okay, this is what I'm hearing from you all and here's how I'm gonna make that decision. 
as the leader because you have that 30,000 foot view. I think another piece is to look at people go through change and transition in different ways and in different timing. Change is the event that happened, okay? We had COVID like drop in our laps before we could even do anything with it. And all of a sudden we're at work and now we're not. All of a sudden businesses are open, now they aren't. So that's the change piece. The psychological side of that is the transition. Some people can get through transitions really quickly. Okay, I see this as an opportunity. Here's my creative ideas. Here's how I want to go forward. Other people get stuck, which we haven't really mentioned yet, in that grief and loss piece. And there's a huge grief and loss part to all of this. With what's happening in the moment, and the anticipatory grief and loss of what else could be lost or what else is going to be changing. So I think what's important as a leader in a small business is, so here's the change, here's what changes are gonna keep happening, here's an ending, and how do I help my employees, how do I help my business transition uh, to make those changes and reach that creative place again? Thank you, Megara. And uh, Mike, your perspective on that. Uh, you're on mute, Mike. Sorry, I think one of the things that uh, the biz owner could do uh, is to make sure that they're communicating to employees about resources that would be helpful for employees. Uh, do they know about Chris's organization? Do they know about some of the Larimer County Workforce Center uh, services if they've got to be furloughed or outsourced? Uh, are you giving them a path to the, to the next step? But uh, a lot of times employees may not know about or have access to the resources, but the business owner might. And one of the things that I will break down a bit is uh, for a lot of smaller business owners, uh, they're wearing a lot of hats. They are the chief financial officer, they're the human resource manager, they're the head salesperson. And uh, I've had the saying in one of the classes we do about starting a business that, you know, as human beings, we've all got strengths and weaknesses and we are good at certain things, we're not so good at other things, but as the business owner, you can't afford to be bad at anything. And that's a pretty good, burden on people and what i point out from that is that if you're not good at numbers you know find a bookkeeper or somebody that can help you with that if you need guidance on what proper hr policy looks like find an hr professional like mcgarr or somebody like that in her organization so i think that's a pretty important part um, and i'm going to definitely double down on something that chris mentioned about uh you know, if you know your employees, how do they relieve stress? What are they, is it, is it positive or is it negative? If their stress relief is that they go to bar for four hours after work, that's not really going to be positive for them. If they're working out or taking a walk or playing with grandkids, uh, uh, they need some sort of outlet to, to help with the stressors of what the virus and the work environment in general bring on. Uh, I, I would just contribute, I had a colleague recommend actually doing periodic check-ins with your employees, a phone call or a Zoom, maybe uh, with an individual employee, just to see how they're doing, um, uh, not to discuss work, but to see how they're doing and whether they need anything. Is that is that a good idea, Chris, uh, something uh, along those lines? Absolutely. Um, it's also, we want to be careful that we honor what that feels like, what that experience is like to different people. Uh, some people, if you check in more than once a week, they feel micromanaged. Some people, if you check in less than once a day, they feel abandoned and distant. So it's honoring what fits for each and every individual. And one of the things that uh, came up in our previous webinar, I, I also want to mention that ties into this, uh, ties directly in to what Mike mentioned, is also understanding the different personalities of the workforce of the team. Uh, we have introverts. We have extroverts, and it's not a black and white, it's more of a continuum. But what do people need in terms of that, both connection and how they engage in self-care uh, is very individual dependent. Absolutely. Chris. Oh, go ahead, Magara, yes. If I, yeah, if I could throw in one other piece on, on, on both of these, these gentlemen too is, how can you as a leader, as the owner of the company, take a few moments and what, what does each employee 
um, bring, what value is what I'm trying to say brings? Does each employee bring to not only getting the work done to the group as a whole, as a system within itself? And how can you, as the leader in those one-on-ones, whether they're daily, hourly, in some cases, Chris, I think, um, or weekly or monthly, however that may look, that you explain their value, all right? Right now, in all of this tentativeness, it's easy for people to lose their sense of value. So what can you do as a leader to help your employees know that they're valued, both as a contributor to the company, as as a contributor, as a human being? Great, thank you, Megara. I want to uh, just kind of intersperse a few of the comments from the audience in terms of the question that I posed about uh, whether they have seen anything positive or surprising through this experience. And uh, uh, Denise says she is blessed to be able to work from home, but she misses her coworkers. So uh, there is an example of someone who enjoys uh, apparently working from home. Uh, Chris, as you alluded to, not not everyone. Uh, it doesn't create stress for everyone. Uh, some people really thrive in that uh, in that environment. Uh, uh, Don says there's been minimal disruption of the business except the government blocking business meetings. So that's had an impact. Um, uh, Sam says telehealth has been approved for mental health with a dramatic drop in missed appointments. Uh, is that something uh, you're seeing, uh, uh, Chris? Uh, uh, it's an increase in telehealth for, for mental health care. Definitely. We, uh, when this all happened mid-March, within a week or two, we had to pivot instantaneously, like most organizations, where we were about 95% in person, 5% virtual, and within about a 10 day period, we had moved to 70, 80% virtual or telehealth. Now, over the last several weeks, we're, we're moving back more and more and more to in-person therapy. I would say we're back up to about 70, 80% in-person, 20, 30% virtual. Um, it seems to be an interesting dynamic that a lot of people will tend to miss their initial appointment in greater quantity just because the commitment level there to show up in person. But once people start the engagement process, they do tend to keep the appointments. There are phenomenal benefits, especially with what's going on with social distancing in society to what telehealth does provide and can provide in the virtual world. There are also very distinct limitations. Uh, the profession of counseling and therapy is very much built on the relationship that takes place one-on-one. -on -one. And this does lead to a topic I know we're gonna be getting to, but uh, one of the very delicate things about the virtual world, whether it's telehealth or business communication, is to be very aware of and very careful of the miscommunication that can take place. The inability to read body language, the inability to pick up the subtleties and nuances of facial expressions and tone of voice, the things that have limits in the virtual world seem to be exacerbated, compounded because of the virtual world. That being said, all things being equal, it has far more benefits than negatives. Well, that's a perfect segue to our, our next question. And actually, we have a comment in the chat uh, that is also a perfect segue. Uh, Denise says that coordinating moving to a remote office was a challenge, but it forced us to move toward getting things in place and continue to work at home. Cost savings versus relationship loss is hard to balance. So uh, the question that I have had, that I have, is what are the implications of remote work for small business owners and employees? And um, uh, I might uh, switch this around and go to uh, Magara first on, on what those implications are, some of the, the give and take, the pros and cons of, of this sort of uh, uh, relationship. You know, it's... <laughs> We, we, take, we could take an entire day <laughs> to sort them out, you know? And, and I think the biggest piece is the, when you're in the office together, there's walking down past someone's cubicle, walking down past their office door, uh, walking down the hallway together and just chatting about sometimes just regular stuff. How are you today? Um, what's happening now in our virtual world, or when we actually have to combine the two together, is there now has to be an intentionality on how to make that everyday connection. And I think Chris, you actually talked about this in, in the answer to the first question, 
that we discussed, that there has to be more intentionality now about wanting to really connect. Uh, you know, there's all these stories out here, and, and I've done it. I have a lot of family back in Wisconsin. So we set up a weekly Zoom. All right, I haven't talked to my family that much in Wisconsin in years, okay? <laughs> but we made that intentionality to try to reconnect because we were missing that even though we don't talk that much, there was still that piece that was gone um, with COVID and having to stay isolated. So I think one of the biggest pieces is you have to be intentional about making sure you're talking about the benign, the mundane, the just general stuff that brings you together. So Mike, your thoughts on that? Uh, yes. Um, we, we definitely have seen the myths of the human touch. Uh, uh, like all consulting, it's very much a trust-based, person-to-person thing. We probably do about 2,700 consulting appointments a year. They all move to virtual. Uh, and we've observed some of the same phenomenon that's been commented on here. I completely agree with Chris. If somebody's going to be a no-show for an appointment, it's likely to be on the first one before they get the value of what you're bringing to the party. Um, and since we've gone to virtual, uh, our whole statewide network, SBDC network, has seen a drop off in uh, cancellations and no-shows because people are much more likely to just jump on and get on the call. Uh, one thing that I'm advocating for, I can't remember who brought this up, but I think a tool that's been kind of underutilized is just picking up the phone and making a phone call. If you're on a Zoom call and maybe you didn't get a reply, pick up the phone and follow up with somebody. Hey, I just wasn't sure what you meant about this. Let's talk about it. Uh, I do feel that's a little more personal than just being on a any Zoom call. So I think that's taking, for me, that's taken on some additional emphasis uh, uh, of what used to be a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, we have uh, Michelle who says, uh, we have an opportunity to learn how to better use virtual technology. We need both. Weekly Zoom is good, but the energy and heart connection is hard to replicate. Energy and touching, et cetera, there is a disconnect. Uh, and she says, she agrees, Mike, uh, use the phone. So. Uh, that that could be a better personal connection. Uh, Chris, do you have uh, further thoughts on this subject? I'll just build on what everybody has mentioned, including um, uh, Michelle, who wrote in that um, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We all have human needs. There's another model often referred to, Dr. Pinksep, that we all have ba seven basic needs at all times in different ratios, a need for control, a need for safety, need for connection, need for touch, need for growth, need for energy, and a need for fun. And right now, the need for safety and control has overwhelmed society so much, we have sacrificed a lot of the need for connection and a lot of the need for touch. And we all have to find our own balance of that, and we just have to be aware of the sacrifices we've made individually and as a society, and just be aware of how to modify that to get the balance we need. Great. And uh, one thing I want to ask quickly of you, uh, Chris, we, we talked about this prior to beginning the webinar today, but we had a, a question submitted uh, in advance by an attendee asking, are you seeing issues with insurance in terms of billing for mental health services for employees? We as an organization are a fee-for-service, cash-based, cash checks, credit cards, so we don't take insurance directly. Um, we refer to other wonderful organizations throughout Northern Colorado that do that. That being said, we do have our own team members, our own employees who, um, best practices, many of them have counselors of their own, and so we do get feedback internally. Um, one thing I would suggest to everybody is make sure you continue an open line of communication with your insurance company. The, the laws and the regulations keep changing so rapidly, not just as a society, but also for the insurance companies, for Medicare, for Medicaid. And so sometimes it's just a matter of the, uh, um, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, so to speak, that you've got to really dive deeper to make sure you're receiving the coverage that your insurance company is obligated to provide. Great. Um, we have a question from the audience. I want to be sure, uh, I'm going to be interspersing these as, as I have. Uh, just so we can get as many of the audience questions answered as possible. Uh, this is a good one and a very timely one. 
How do small businesses plan for the irregularity of the return to school for children of employees? We still have deadlines and don't want to double hire for positions. So uh, I would open that up and uh, maybe, maybe uh, 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 Mike, do you want to address that one first? Uh, yes, I had a meeting with my uh, team yesterday because uh, we are physically moving our offices as well as looking at all of our consulting with we have 40 some odd consultants we have a whole bunch of clients and, and I said the operative word is going to be flexibility, we, we have to be nimble, uh, we have to look at whether something's going to be person to person or face to face and I would use that same logic uh, here. I mean, what are your resources that you have to work with? Uh, how can things be structured within the family unit to based off of what the new normal is gonna be? But it's a, it's a hard thing to predict, particularly when you see uh, how uh, unpredictable and expansive the virus results might be. Anyone, anyone else uh, on that? I'll, I'll chime in. I, uh... I'm part of a member of society like everyone else. I have a beautiful 11-year-old daughter, seven-year-old son, and our daughter's entering middle school. So we've got two different schools, elementary and middle, to juggle. And we're in the midst of this with everyone else. Um, part of the challenge is that we are facing, that we are, like everything else, is the continual stream of new updates. And the principals and the superintendent are doing a fantastic job and they have to keep adapting to what's going on in terms of the latest news from the CDC, um, the World Health Organization and so on, as well as the federal and state governments. So it really is back to what Mike said, it really is gonna be pivotal that families themselves continue to embrace that need for flexibility, embrace the adaptability and also not play those mental and emotional games of resisting the adaptation that's necessary because this is definitely one of the areas where we can create our own stress um, because the reality is it is a stressful situation. The more we can quote unquote go with the flow, um, the more we will have the ability to at least adapt and lower the stress within uh, relative means. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm going to turn to the next question. We've got uh, uh, just about 13 minutes left here. I want to make sure we get to a couple more questions. Um, uh, and Mike, you mentioned uncertainty regarding the pandemic. And of course, that generates additional uncertainty in terms of the economy and uh, business uncertainty. Where, where will a given business's sales be in six months or a year? How does that high level of uncertainty during this pandemic affect small business owners? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a couple of bullet point comments about that. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna mention is uh, uh, maybe a little historical, but uh, there was a study done of prisoners of war. Uh, I can't remember whether it was from Vietnam or Korea, and uh, they were looking and evaluating who survived and who didn't. And there's a, a phenomenon that's called the the Stockman Stockdale paradox, and what it said was that the people that survived, they weren't the wild optimists, they weren't the people who were totally depressed, they, they were the people who were able to hold two different opposing points of view in their head. And one was just a sense of optimism that things would work out, combined with a real world assessment of where things are uh, today, what their situation was. So uh, that's kind of what the need is here. And I'm not comparing this to a prisoner war situation, but the mental, outlook is very similar. Uh, uh, I think it's really important that as business owners, uh, we have to be able to know what's important to surviving the business. Uh, we are inundated with information that's gotten worse. Uh, Chris and Magar talked about that earlier, but we have to be able to separate that as business people versus what's the key stuff I need to run the business. Do I really know how much uh, money I need on a month to month basis to run this business after I've reduced expenses, et cetera. Do I really know uh, what customer orders I can expect to continue? And for me, it helps to put together a list. This is key stuff I'm gonna work on and I'm gonna separate that from just what's 
what's noise, what's political noise, what's interesting information, but not relevant to running the business. So, and then I think it's important from that, that you take action. I think there is a satisfying yet fulfilling process that results when you take action as a business owner, even though you're not going to have perfect information, but you've probably got enough to go with the probabilities. And I think if you're able to do that, uh, that helps you manage the business and you can augment that by getting advice from experts, from resources, from trusted partners, from key employees, etc. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Magara, how, how would you see the high level of business uncertainty affecting small business owners? Yeah, I think, I think this a piece that, that's coming to mind for me is, is the idea of what's surviving, you know, what does it take for the business to survive? What does it take for the business to thrive? And then where does resilience fit in? I, I saw a chat, I couldn't read the whole chat. Somebody just said something about resilience in the chat. You know, so again, where can you as the business owner, as the leader, sort out your vision of surviving, thriving, and what it takes to be resilient? And then how can you have those discussions, again, distribute the effort, have those discussions with your employees? And what I was envisioning as, as Mike was talking or, or you were teeing up the question, Chris, is I kind of see an empty wall, maybe the wall here behind me, and there's a chart. Like, can you create structure? All right, here's the school, here's the school schedule for my kids. Here's what I can do. And that chart on a, even a whiteboard. All right, it's got to change this week. It's got to change this week. Here's the next piece. And you actually have a drawing that people can see, that you can flex with, that you can create what it's going to take to be resilient and reach that point of thriving. That's just kind of a wild air idea that popped into my head. So I'll let Chris take it from here or anybody else. <laughs> I'll add on to that. Combining what Mike and McGar said is um, there's certain keys in terms of um, the high level of business uncertainty and how it affects the small business. Um, the leader's role and to engage as many team members, employees as possible would be ideal, but taking the time and putting the energy in to the planning, the strategy, the strategic planning itself, looking at and analyzing the cash flow, and not just what you think the numbers are, but truly run the numbers, know what the numbers are, don't speculate, deal with stress. Most importantly, we all make better decisions when we lower the stress. We all make less optimal decisions when we make those decisions under the burden and the blanket of stress itself. So finding ways to disengage and get out of the moment by moment stresses so that you can think clearly, whatever that means to you, you're gonna make a better set of decisions. And then I would also add, and tie to what Mike said, be very, very careful of getting involved in the paralysis of analysis. At some point you have to take action. At some point you have to implement. And all successful people, all successful business owners of any kind understand sometimes we're all better off taking action and then course correcting as we go as opposed to being frozen by fear. Great, thank you, Chris. And, and one thing we talked about at the Workplace Interrupted webinar a couple of weeks ago was the importance of separating work life from home life when working at home. And I'm wondering if uh, 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 each of you could kind of address that and maybe some strategies for, for business owners or managers or employees who are in that situation where there are so many distractions, the dog, the kids, the uh, construction outside, the trash people, or whatever it might be, so many distractions that occur, uh, how can a, a business owner or, or an employee uh, maintain or develop that separation when they are working from home? And uh, uh, I might uh, go ahead and start with Chris again. Well, there's the practicality of planning your day learning how to work and manage a calendar, work and manage a schedule, and being very, very deliberate in what that looks like. But then also, on a family level, asking for help. Um, 
can't ask so much for help from the dog and the cat, but in terms of other family members, really engaging them and, um, and it's never a bad thing to involve young children within reason, depending on age, and, and helping them understand the responsibilities that go with supporting a family, the responsibilities that go with running a household. Um, and then back to something Mike uh, mentioned earlier, actually Mike and McGraw, reach out, get the help you need, utilize the resources that are there in the community. The SBDC has some of the most phenomenal resources that are dramatically underutilized, same with Employers Council, that there are people who are expert in these areas and sometimes simply getting an outside voice, a mentor, a coach um, can make all the difference. Great, so uh, Magara, uh, how would you recommend that people keep that work life and home life separated? Uh, again, I agree completely with Chris that there are those distinctions and the more family members can understand where those distinctions are. In other words, one of my favorite phrases is ask for what you need or accept what you get. So part of what this is about is being able to ask for what you need and you check with your family members, you check with whomever, you know, so what are you guys needing here? All right, right now I'm needing the door closed. I have to focus on work and it's going to last approximately this long. You know, figure out what you're going to do. <laughs> um, so having those distinctions and asking for what you need and getting others to ask for what they need and then sticking to it, be consistent. You know, maybe there has to be a family meeting every morning or maybe at the start of the week. Here's what my week looks like. Here's what I've got to do for work this week. Here's when I've got to be in the office and uninterrupted. Here's when I'm going to go out and play with you and take a walk around the block. All right, here's when we're going to take the dog out. Here's where we're going to go check on the horses. One of the people I'm coaching right now, he goes out and, and he and his daughter check the horses. He gets, makes himself get up and go out with her, his youngest daughter to do that. So making those distinctions, asking for what you need, and setting a schedule. Great. And Mike? Um, I'm going to say that I believe it's pretty important to compartmentalize your time to the best that you can. Uh, I use the example that, okay, work uh, career, it's pretty tough right now, and it would be pretty easy just to have that be the only television screen in your life, and you're looking at work, and oh my God, I got this challenge, but broaden the thinking out a little bit. You're going to have your work time, but think of nine TV screens up there. This is my personal health. This is my family. This is my friends and relationships, and what are you doing in each one of those TV screens? Because you might have some very interesting stuff going on, and uh, that needs to be cultivated as well, too. Great. Thank you, Mike. And uh, we're just about out of time. I want to uh, give the panelists uh, one opportunity to discuss uh, uh, very briefly what resources might be out there for small business owners who are struggling. And uh, we'll start with Chris. I think we've touched on this on, on a few occasions already. Uh, first of all, all three of us have different resources we can provide. Mike's organization, uh, SBDC, is not only one organization, but it's an umbrella for multiple, multiple other resources. And uh, we've worked with them in the past, and sometimes they don't have all the answers, but they are exceptional at knowing who to talk to. They can lead to other resources. Um, Employers Council, we've been a member of their organization for years. And again, they have many answers, not just on the legal front, but on the human resource front as well as other resources. I would also point out or mention, we have some of the best chambers of commerce in the state, in the nation, um, between the Fort Collins Chamber, Loveland Chamber, Windsor Chamber, Greeley Chamber, and so on. There are sensational resources. Uh, one just has to take the initiative to reach out and, and see where that leads. Great, um, Magara. You know, I too, I, I don't know how many small businesses actually through their insurance um, have EAP programs, employee assistant programs. You know, those EAP programs often not only can provide some counseling and some triage right away if someone's in crisis, they can provide different programs too. You know, so make sure you're checking with the EAP. And 
I mean, as long as you mentioned it, Chris, I have to throw an employer's counsel again too then. Um, you know, we offer, besides our legal and our HR and the department that I work in is the organizational development and learning department. You know, so the opportunity to be able to develop some of those high potential people. You just need a class to try to connect. One of the things we do in our OD classes is really, even virtual, try to help people connect so they don't feel so isolated besides learning the content, how they can also learn from each other. So there's all those types of opportunities that are available too. Great, thank you, Megara and Mike. Uh, I will uh, thank Chris for the shout out for the SBDC. I will say that SCORE is another national organization that provides business consulting. I'm a big fan likewise of our local chambers and some other of uh, the business associations. If people need human resource help, there's the Employer Council, there's the Larimer County Workforce Center. Uh, maybe they need some research done. Our libraries have great business librarians. It's a great resource. I love what uh, uh, the organization Loco Think Tank is doing for non-competing peer-to-peer networking. Uh, I like what Startup Week is doing, and I really like what uh, I've always been a fan of Biz West and the credible, uh, accurate information that, uh, that uh, you bring to the party, because there is a real value into having accurate, useful, real-time information. All right, well, thank you very much. And I, I wanna thank each of our panelists one more time. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for uh, doing double duty on both webinars uh, that we've done on this topic. Uh, thank you to Megara for all of your expertise and insights and to Mike as well. Thank you all very much uh, for contributing uh, to the webinar today. I want to once again thank our sponsors, our title sponsor, Delta Dental. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, and everyone at Delta Dental. And thank you to Chris and Foundations Counseling LLC uh, for your sponsorship as well. A uh, couple of housekeeping measures. Uh, a webinar survey will be sent to all attendees to get your feedback on our conversation and webinar this morning. And you will also be receiving in the next day or so an archived recording uh, link uh, uh, of this webinar. And we will be sending you some tips uh, that we are deriving from the conversation today, some ideas and uh, uh, hopefully useful uh, takeaways that you can uh, implement in your own business. Uh, I wanna mention a couple of upcoming Biz West events. We have our virtual Bravo Entrepreneur Awards on July 29th and our COVID-19 series, Managing Your Cash During the Crisis. That webinar will be on July 30th. And Women of Distinction, a big event for us in Northern Colorado, will be August 26th. So I wanna thank everyone one more time, our, our panelists, our sponsors, and our attendees, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.